Hey friends, Elisa Childers here. Today we're going to talk about the prosperity gospel. We've heard terms like name it and claim it and health and wealth. Today we're going to talk with someone who grew up with a very unique perspective as an insider in this worldwide movement. He's going to tell us his story and his thoughts on some of their beliefs in just a moment. Well, I have a really interesting discussion to share with you today. I'm really excited for you to get to hear from my guest, Kosti Hinn. But before we get to that, I thought I might share just a few little updates of things that are going on with the blog and podcast and the ministry in general. The first would be my book proposal. I've mentioned on the podcast before that I believe God's laid it on my heart to write a book about progressive Christianity. So I've been really deep in research on that's why I've been doing so many book reviews on the blog, because I, I'm just kind of blogging my way through my research as I go. Uh, so the book proposal is finished. It's completed. It's going to be going out this week. So please be praying that uh, just that it will land on the right desks, that the right people will take notice, that uh, just that the Lord, as I know He will, will guide this whole process. Another thing I wanted to give you a heads up about is last year, around this time, about the second week of November, I took the rest of November and all of December off to just kind of hunker down with my family and enjoy the holidays and not have any blogs or podcasts or anything hanging over my head. And uh, that was just a really uh, rejuvenating time for me. So I'm going to do that again this year. So, uh, I'm going to post this podcast and then there'll be one more after this with Craig Keener. And we'll be talking about the reliability of the book of Acts that's already recorded and it's great. And I can't wait for you to hear that. And then I've got an article coming out on the gospel coalition on November 13th. And then I think after that, I'm just going to close up shop for a little while and just enjoy the holidays with my family. And then one last thing, if you like this podcast, if you find the information in it helpful, would you go on over to iTunes and leave a review? I know it may seem silly, but it really does help get the podcast into the hands of more people when it has a lot of good reviews. It helps with credibility and things like that. So if you don't mind taking a minute and going on over to iTunes and leave a review, I would be so very grateful. Well, without further ado, let's get right into today's discussion. My guest today is Costi Hinn, the nephew of world-famous televangelist Benny Hinn. Several years ago, uh, he began to doubt the theological paradigm in which he grew up and ended up speaking out it, against it in his book, Defining Deception. His testimony has been featured on CNN and Christianity Today. He's the executive pastor at Mission Bible Church in Orange County, California, and he's completing his Master's of Divinity at Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. Costi, it is so great to have you on the show and uh, to talk about your story, and I think it's one that is really uh, important for people to hear, so welcome. Thank you so much, Elisa. Thanks for having me on. Well, I want to start with your story because I think that's something that we're all interested in hearing. You, you grew up as a part of this movement. What was it like for you growing up as the nephew of a famous televangelist? What was your life like? I have uh, described it in terms that are synonymous with the royal family because of the lifestyle and the wealth mm. and the insulation that you experience when you're in that circle. So, you know, complete with security details and, you know, the nicest hotels in the world, the best restaurants, the best shopping, the best homes, the most luxurious lifestyle you could imagine. That was life on the inside. So when was it that you first started to doubt or even to just question the paradigm you grew up with, the theological paradigm? What What was the... I mean, I don't know if it was a, a series of breadcrumbs or if it was one major event that just kind of woke you up, but, but what was it that started your doubts and questions about what you were being taught? I'd say both. There were breadcrumbs all throughout. For example, when I was younger, around my teenage years, we would see things happen or we would see things not happen, like people not get healed when they were promised healing or we'd see prophecies that were prophesied not actually come to pass. And I'd wonder, you know, I'd 
I thought, if God really said that, why didn't it come true? Or if we can really heal at will and, you know, do miraculous things and we can wield gifts of healing, then, you know, why can't we go heal my friend who got cancer in high school? Things like that caused questions in my mind. But uh, like a lot of people, when you are attached to your family, you love your family, and there's people you trust and you follow, this happens in church a lot nowadays, we dismiss the flaws and the shortcomings of our leaders and say, well, you know, there's probably a good explanation or maybe God changed his mind. And so I would question. And then kind of the ultimate gag order was if you did have a question and you pushed too far, we would be told, you know, careful touching the Lord's anointed, careful questioning a man of God. And so that was, that's breadcrumbs sort of in a snapshot, lots of little moments like that but they would be quickly snuffed out. And then as I got older, I would refer to it as my grace awakening moment was, you know, when I ended up through a series of providential events at a church, the church I'm at now, um, in the early phases of a church plant. So it was really open and it was not a big deal. Nobody really cared that I was a hen. And when I was there, I was assigned to preach a sermon. And I've told this story many times. It was John 5, 1 through 17, the healing at the pool of Bethesda. And I was studying a passage on healing, ironically, and came face to face with the sovereignty of God and healing. And it Mm. just blew my mind. And so that was my grace awakening moment when all the questions came to a head. And, you know, if it was a movie, that would be the moment we all see, like, you know, I'd be sitting there in my office and then just picture flashbacks of Mm. moment after moment and moment after moment as I'm staring at God's word. And then everything just came flooding through and I was, my eyes were open to the truth. For some people listening, they might think of Benny Hinn and all they can picture is just the kind of wild stuff they see on TV where he's blowing on the audience and everybody falls down or waving the jacket around. You know, we've all seen those clips, but maybe you can help us understand uh, what is really being taught in this movement. What What is the view of healing? What is the view of uh, how God works? What's What's the general paradigm? Uh, what's the gospel they're preaching? I call it gospel plus, because mm. it is, in many ways, the gospel we're all used to. It's Jesus died in our place. Jesus forgives our sins. Jesus provides a way to heaven. All of those are there in the gospel. And then there's the plus part. It's that, you know, Jesus died and in his atonement is healing. Now, we all know that in the atonement was healing, but they would say, well, yeah, of course, healing in heaven for everyone. No more tears, no more death, no more sadness, no more sickness in heaven. But they would say, well, Jesus died for all of that now. And so his atonement in that gospel means that everybody should be, if you're saved, healed. So not only salvation provided through the cross, but guaranteed healing. And now we start getting into that gospel plus prosperity driven, healing centered uh, focus in which you are saved. And therefore, because of your faith, you should also be totally free of sickness. You should be walking in total victory. You should have blessings and you should have provision. And so one of my favorite, um, at that, at that time, one of my favorite teachers in this movement was Kenneth Copeland, one of the guys in our circle. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he would often make the joke that we have this treasure in heaven And it does await us in heaven, but that God has given us the ability to start cashing in on it now. And that's where you get into your Joel Osteen best life now. And we preached that gospel. We taught it. And so it's Jesus with a whole bunch of benefits. Mm. And that, of course, leads down a very, very dangerous road. It sure does. And I'm thinking back to high school when I had a friend whose mom was diagnosed with cancer. And I was raised in the charismatic church, not particularly in the faith and prosperity side of things, although I think some of that theology was very influential in the charismatic church at large. And so I just remember this woman 
believing with all her heart that Jesus was going to heal her. And she believed that until her dying day when she finally died of cancer. And I remember that being one of the first sort of pebbles in my shoe about this, that not everyone who believes in full faith for healing is actually going to be healed. And so in this movement, how is that then explained in that, in that world? If someone doesn't get healed, what's, what's the explanation of that? Instead of turning to passages like James 1 verse 2, you know, that we are going to go through trials and James encourages us, us to count it all joy when we encounter those trials and that God is testing our faith through those trials. And Romans talks about that. And we see Paul preaching to the Galatians in Galatians 4, and he's, it's, he's in bodily illness when he does. We see all that. And, of course, the story of Job in the Old Testament. We wouldn't turn to those passages and say, you know, see, brothers and see, sisters, there is times when God heals. And there's times when he doesn't. And when he does, we praise him. And when he doesn't, we praise him. He's good all the time. And we trust his ways and his purposes are good. All of that would be maybe a biblical theology of healing. We would move right away to blaming the sick person Hmm. and saying, well, you don't have enough faith. And so they get really frustrated and they start thinking, well, how do I exercise more faith? And that's when we get more dangerous teachings where people would say, uh, if you want God to do something for you, you need to do something for him. Hmm. And you need to sacrifice and you need to give and you need to step out in faith and do something uncommon if you want an uncommon breakthrough. And those are really, really divisive statements where you start to put people in a position to uh, be at odds with God. If I don't do enough, he won't do this. And then that's when God becomes a a magic genie. And if you rub Mm. him right, he'll give you health, give you wealth, he'll make you happy. And if you don't, the problem is you your faith. And I'll add one more element to that is you maybe are, uh, doing something that is frowned upon by the pastor or the leader. And so, for example, I've seen people before that, uh, you know, have friends who have left the church, let's say, and the leader will say, well, the reason God isn't healing you is because you have those negative friends in your life who left our church. And wow. you need you need to get away from them. You have, they have a negative spirit, and that negative spirit is stealing your healing. And if you want to be healed, you need to stay in this church. You need to stay around these people, and you need to cut everybody out of your life who makes negative confessions or doesn't think our church is anointed. And that's where you create silos and a gag order, and people mm-hmm. get manipulated and abused. And I'll add one final thing. A lot of this is patterns that many abusive leaders have in other movements too. It's Mm. cult-like. We see it with politicians. We see it with other abusers that target an audience or an individual for a specific purpose. And they insulate that individual from everybody around them so they can exploit them. That's Mm. what these teachers do. You know, this sounds so much like a book I just read. I just reviewed Lisa Gunger's spiritual memoir of sorts. And of course, the Gungers are always in the Christian news for their evolving beliefs about God and Christianity. And what's so interesting about her story is that one of the reasons that she ended up walking away from historic Christianity was exactly what you're describing. She was raised in a almost cult-like sect of Christianity that had this mentality that, mm-hmm. you know, you do enough for God and you'll get something back. You, you pray enough, you fast enough, you do all these things, and then you'll have all this major mm-hmm. blessing in your life. You'll never be sick and you'll have all your dreams will come true and that kind of thing. But of course, when that starts to fall apart, people's faith falls apart too. And sadly, in the case of the Gungers, instead of just correcting those theological errors, They've walked away from historic Christianity and thrown the baby out with the bathwater, which is, of course, very sad. But it it is interesting, just the fruit of this theology. Mm -hmm. Uh, I want to ask you also, because it's not just about health, it's also about wealth. Talk a little bit about the teachings on money and prosperity in the sense of having possessions and material goods and how that fits into the the theology of this movement. Yeah, well, everything is driven uh, 
back to what I can get out of or from God. So if I give, I give to get. If I Mm. do something, God will do something for me. And so the same way that you would tap into your health is the way that you would tap into your wealth. You would speak a positive confession. You would begin to think about things. You're told even uh, to have thoughts that are focused on what you want. And then your thoughts will create your life, which is very new age and new thought movement kind of mysticism. And here's the twist. A lot of principles are in the New Testament that actually have to do with thinking on the right things. Remember, Paul tells us to dwell on things that are above. He tells us to have a a mind that is focused on whatever is right, whatever is true, whatever is pure. So there is a way of thinking that a Christian should have, and our mind should be on a higher plane than the things of this world. But all of that is spiritual and eternal, and it's focusing on heaven and Christ and the security I have in him when my circumstances are difficult. It's not a a kind of mystical, alter your reality by thinking these things. And so it's important to understand that there's also principles biblically on sowing and reaping and giving and receiving. Yes, and Paul says, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. And we see the principles for generosity in Second Corinthians. So everything is laid out biblically. And then what this movement and other teachers do is they twist and malign things that are very, very biblical and true to fit their own agenda. So you take the sowing and sparing principle and you tell people, if you sow a little, you're going to get a little. But if you sow a lot, you're going to get a lot. And now I'm going to add something in that maybe you're familiar with, Alisa. But let's say we take the hundredfold blessing. Mm-hmm. And we take a little Old Testament principles and we isogetically um, yank them out of the text. And we kind of throw out something like, you know, first fruits. And then we'll use the word tithing. And then we'll use a little Malachi chapter three and say, you're robbing God. And now I've taken, you know, multiple pieces of the Bible that have various contexts in various, you know, times. And I've now made them somehow some 2018 television sales pitch in which I'm on my TBN show. And I'm saying, you know, if you give this, this, and this, if God will do this for you, and if you sow seven thousand seven hundred and seventy seven dollars because seven is God's perfect number and all of those things, and we could go on all day about all that, God's going to and then fill in the blank. The wealth side of things, last thing I'll say on that is it appeals to the most basic human need. Everybody mm-hmm. wants to be able to pay their rent or their mortgage. Everybody wants to be able to provide a good life for their kids. Everybody wants to have food, clothing, and shelter. And what the prosperity gospel does is it appeals to the most basic needs in a very flamboyant and aggressive way and sells the American dream to everybody. Mm-hmm. So people think, okay, great. I'll do the formula. They're not thinking at all. Does the Bible really say that? They're just thinking about getting the American dream and having a better way of life. And as Christians and as preachers, we need to tell them the truth about suffering, the truth about healing, the truth about wealth, the truth about the gospel, and make sure that their souls are saved, not just trying to get them temporary relief from their trials. Right, because all throughout the New Testament, we see a theme of... I mean, if, if they were going to make a real God's Promises book, <laughs> it would be filled of promises of, you know, you're, you're going to partake in the sufferings of Christ. Mm-hmm. The world is going to hate you. In this world, you're going to have trouble. And uh, I, I think that it's, it, that was the one thing for me. I wasn't really exposed to the prosperity gospel until I was in my early 20s. And I was actually dating a guy that was kind of into that movement. So we would go around to different churches. And I remember just, I wasn't really uh, intellectual in my faith yet, but I knew that what was being said and taught was different than what I was reading in my Bible, because I was a student of the Bible. I loved reading the Bible. And I remember thinking, goodness, these verses that they're all saying, like, I have never in my entire life thought those verses were about money. You know, and it's like they were taking all of these random verses and making them about material things. And so I know for, for me, it was, it was just like, I, I don't 
find this in my Bible. And so it wasn't something, thank, thank God, by the grace of God, I didn't get really sucked into. Although I, I do have to admit that I was influenced by it, uh, being in the charismatic church. Uh, so I want to ask you, I've done a couple of podcasts on the things like the new apostolic reformation, the mystical miracle movement, which is really something you focus on in your book, Defining Deception. And it seems to me that the prosperity gospel and the new apostolic reformation, mystical miracle movement seem to intersect at some point. Can you talk about that a little bit? What, how are they related to each other or are they related to each other? And uh, how, how, how would you characterize that? Yeah. Um, the way I have characterized it in different conferences or, or talks or teachings that I've done is by helping people understand that in the old days, it was TBN and it was televangelists and it was kind of big hair and, and big promises. And, you know, my uncle in a white suit waving his jacket. Mm -hmm. And now it's V-necks and skinny jeans and cool music. Yeah. So it is this... It's the same dangerous heretical theology with a new face. And where the new apostolic reformation comes in is around 2004, you have a fuller seminary professor named C. Peter Wagner, who makes this prophetic announcement that God had told him that the office of apostle was once again being restored. And so the modern day apostles are going to take authority over the church and you have prophets as well, though they're lesser um, and that they're going to be the authority of the church. Now, like the early church and the apostles and the foundational apostles of you know the biblical era, when you see Ephesians 2.20, that they were the foundation of the church. Um, these apostles nowadays are saying, well, they can speak and control the weather. They can control, they're going to, turn over governments. They're going to uh, turn over the church, cause revival, and they are prophetic and they have authority. They can speak things into existence, etc. cetera. Um, that's where you get this, I, I, would res I would call it kind of the, the snowball that has gotten so large that it's out of control. Mm -hmm. What started as some health and wealth gospel, what started as some televangelists making big promises is now a global movement of people where they have, uh, you know, you can pay to be an apostle. You can pay a, a couple's rate to be an apostle. Mm -hmm. You can go to a school and pay tuition to be taught how to wield miraculous gifts and be an apostle. And I've got family members that have gone to these schools and graduated. I've got family members that are caught up in the NAR and all of them have this idea that they can speak to healing and control it, that they can speak to any sickness and cast it out. Uh, meanwhile, I've seen on many occasions them not be able to, even in their own bodies. So what I would say is on the most basic human level, this is a movement and a theology that is not only, it's not only dark and it's not only dangerous and all of that, but what it appeals to is people being able to control their reality because they're insecure. They're mm -hmm. scared. They don't know their Bible. They don't trust the promises of God. They don't know about God's sovereignty in a true sense, in a biblical sense. They don't have a confidence like Paul that in the midst of lack and in the midst of prosperity, in the midst of sickness, in the midst of health, come hell or high water, he is rooted in Christ. There's a security when you know who you are and you know Christ and you know his word. You kind of say, well, you know, the world's going to come at me. Satan's going to attack. And yes, the world is dark, but my God is an overcoming God and Christ will return and heaven is coming. And so it's a, it's a different view. And I'll give you a, a personal example. When I share you know, certain things with people in that world when I'm talking to them or trying to evangelize them, you know, even just as of recently, we had, you know, some health issues come up in our own uh, life and the fear that grips any family members that I talk to about things like that, the fear that grips them mm. is remarkable where in our home, we might say, you know, that, well, God is sovereign and we're going to trust the Lord no matter what they're, they're, 
getting olive oil out and they're casting out sickness and they're saying in Jesus name, no sickness will touch us. Well, I can tell you this, Elisa, in our personal family, uh, one of my parents had a, a brain tumor. Um, I've had other family members have their lives basically completely uh, destroyed by debt and they've gone bankrupt. I've had others have uh, ongoing health issues and uh, diabetes, obesity, um, certain thyroid issues. I mean, issues galore from our health yeah. standpoint. And when you talk about them, they'll say things like, well, I, I choose to ignore reality and I choose to live in the reality of Christ and what he bought for me on the cross. So I'm not sick. And you're, you're staring at a doctor's report saying, you are sick. And they're saying, nope, in Jesus' name, I'm not. And that is the NAR, Word of Faith Movement, prosperity, all of it in a nutshell. Mm. Ignore reality and just live in this world that you think you can control, but you can't. And I would imagine in the Hinn family, that's probably not very publicized, like no. issues like sickness and stuff. You know? Not at all. We're going to come right back to this conversation in just a moment. But man, as a Christian parent, I so want to equip my kids to interact with some of these false theologies as they grow up. And I think the best way to do that is, yes, expose kids to other worldviews like atheism and world religions and counterfeit versions of Christianity. But more important than any of that is to model and teach the real thing. How would it sound for you as a Christian parent to have your teenager immersed in the real thing for a solid week? Well, that's exactly what Impact 360 Propel Experience seeks to do. It's a week-long camp-like environment where they're going to learn what they believe, why they believe it, how to live in community with other Christians. I just can't recommend it highly enough. Right now is the early bird pricing. If you go to impact360.org slash propel, you're going to get $100 off your tuition. But if you use my name as a promo code, that's ALISA, all caps, A-L-I-S-A, you'll get an additional $50 off for a total of $150 off. And that's good until December 31st. So take advantage of that. And I'll be there. I was there last year. I'll be there again speaking this year. I'd love to meet your teenager this summer at Propel. All right, back to our discussion with Costi Hinn. So I'm, I'm just thinking if somebody's listening to this and maybe they've been a little bit influenced by this movement and they know somebody or maybe even they themselves, you know, I actually know somebody who says they were watching Benny Hinn and Benny Hinn said, if you're sick, you know, put your hand toward the TV and you're going to be healed. And I, I know there are people who would say I did that and I was healed. So is that a defeat or what, what would you say to them? Yeah. So John 10 is really clear. Jesus says, my sheep know my voice. And then he says, I have more sheep. I must bring them. And we're essentially taught that there are sheep in this world and Jesus is going to save them no matter what. And they belong to God. And so I, I know people as well. One woman approached me at our church one Sunday and had the same question. She said, you know, I, I know your uncle is quite heretical, but he's still a part of my story. Back some years ago, I was sick and I heard, put your hands on the TV. I was watching his program. I did. And then, you know, short time later, my spine was healed. And this woman does not follow my uncle anymore. She is uh, following the Lord for all intents and purposes that I'm aware of. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know where she went after that. She went to a different church now. But overall, let's just say that she got healed and it was legitimate. If God is superintending the lives of his people and he loves his people and he's guiding and shaping and saving, then certainly there may be a moment where an individual is crying out to the Lord and he heals them. Hmm. I wouldn't say he's using my uncle. I wouldn't say that he's using the TV. I wouldn't say that he's using anything about that movement. He's just simply seeing the faith of his child in that moment. And we know that Jesus sometimes was moved by faith and other times not. In that moment, though, God providentially and sovereignly chooses to heal an individual. And that's great. 
I think if you track some of the people that do get healed or do walk with the Lord after being involved with my uncle's ministry or others, is that they always had questions. They were always a sheep, and then eventually they come out of the movement. And that would be, you know, what I would say to that. And I'm, I'm no expert on every situation. I don't sure. know everybody, so I can't speak to everyone. Yeah. But you're not saying God can't heal someone. You're, you're just, you're, you're speaking more to the theology that is being espoused by this movement. Yeah. Oh, I would say, of course, God can heal somebody, even as, you know, I, people ask me all the time, you know, are you cessationist? What are you? And everybody wants to know the labels. Um, right. I don't even like the word cessationist because it has such a negative correlation. But I will say this. Yes, by definition, I am. And I'm in the non-normative camp, which means that I view miraculous sign gifts as being non-normative today. You have a normative pattern in the New Testament, and then you have the non-normative pattern today, which you might see people get healed today. Of course, God's a healing God. And can God do things that are supernatural today? Of course he can. We serve a supernatural God. He does the miraculous, of course, starting with the miracle of conversion. So God can heal people. Absolutely. But we don't want to get confused for a second between the sovereign loving hand of God healing an individual and an endorsement of a a false teacher. God may heal someone in a moment, but that does not endorse anything outside of that moment. It's God and his daughter or God and his little son there on earth in their sickness being healed and not the hands of a heretical false teacher. Well, I'm really glad that you brought up that issue of cessationism versus continuationism, because I think often when someone comes along and they criticize the NAR or they criticize the prosperity gospel, uh, some, I have seen this happen a lot on Facebook. In fact, I would, I would actually go so far to say that every time I've posted about NAR in particular, I haven't really posted a lot on prosperity gospel. Mm -hmm. This may be the first one, but, uh, every time I've posted on NAR or talked about it on the podcast, someone has inevitably come on and say, and they'll say something like, you know, this is just a bunch of cessationists that are against the gifts. And that's what this Mm -hmm. is all about. And, um, and that's when I'll actually kind of say, you know, I grew up in the charismatic church. Uh, I think it was fairly, fairly balanced and and conservative. Uh, I would, I, I would call myself today, probably I would call myself a really, really cautious and skeptical continuationist. Um, and so I'm not a cessationist. And so when I criticize NAR or I am talking about some theological points, it's not because I think the gifts have ceased or something like that. And I love that in your book, you actually point out that you make a really good distinction. Although you would call yourself a cessationist, you're not saying that's the reason you're criticizing these movements. You're criticizing them because they're unbiblical and it's, they strike to the heart of the actual gospel. Would you, would you say that's true? 100 yeah. percent. If if I were a charismatic right now and I was one of those reformed charismatics, I would be talking about the exact same things I am right now. I would be up on my soapbox, you know, saying, you know, Bill Johnson, you can't say that Jesus did his miracles as just a man in right relationship with God and not as God. Uh, You can't say in two different books that Jesus laid aside his divinity. You can't say that. Um, I would, I would get up and say to, you know, the Todd Whites of the world, you know, you can't say that the cross is just about your value and it's not really a revelation of your sin. The cross is a revelation of our sin. Christ was uh, on the cross taking the wrath of God in our place. You, you have to talk about the true gospel. I would still be saying, you cannot say that everybody is guaranteed healing because of the atonement on earth. Yeah. You can say everyone's guaranteed healing in heaven, just like I'm guaranteed treasure in heaven and a glorified body in heaven. And I'm going to live forever in heaven, but I'm still going to die on earth. I'm not in a glorified body yet. And I don't have guaranteed earthly healing yet. The atonement uh, has 
future promises that will be realized. That's the beauty of the future. I don't get everything now. I'm excited for what's ahead because that's heaven. That's the best of the best. So I would yeah. still, if I was a Reformed charismatic, be advocating for a proper definition of the biblical gifts, a proper definition of the doctrine of Christ, ensuring that our Christology is biblically sound, that we're not teaching old heresies in new ways. And I would 100% still be advocating for not making big blanket promises that are all about health and wealth. Yeah. We have to have a proper theology of suffering. I was just going to say that because I, I wonder too, if some of, you know, I think evangelicalism at large has been really greatly influenced by the prosperity gospel, or at least the average Christian has. I would say, at least in my circles, it seems like it's been very influential in some of our theology. And I, you know, and then as an apologist, so many people walk away from God because of the perceived problem of evil and yes. problem of suffering in the world. Like, how do we make sense of God being good and loving, but all of this evil going on? But really, I think the influence of this type of theology has has helped promote that. And even in uh, a lot of the progressive Christian world, where that seems to also be a hugely unresolved issue is the the perceived problem of suffering. And I think that if we would all get back to our Bibles and really need, we all need to learn how to suffer well, because that's, I mean, we're promised that that's going to happen. We are to deny ourselves, to take up our cross and follow Jesus. The cross was an instrument of death and mm. we're to take that up. And so I think that, that yeah, this, this prosperity thing has has influenced the average Christian to the point where they can't, they haven't been taught to suffer well and developed a theology of suffering, which um, I think is just really important in, in a Christian life of just living in this world. So I'm really, I'm glad you brought that up. So I wanted to ask you, uh, there was an article you wrote recently that really caught my attention because we're going to kind of zero in on a specific thing here because this is something, again, I didn't see a lot growing up, but when I was sort of in this world in my early 20s going around to different churches, the issue of being slain in the spirit. So hmm. this is something you worked as a catcher for your uncle's ministry for a while, <laughs> and <laughs> which, you know, I've, I've been in a, a lot of meetings where this went on. I've been in meetings where I even went up to be prayed for and nothing happened, or the guy tried to push me down and it didn't work. And yep. I even had a friend uh, with me at one of the meetings, and she went up, up on the stage to be prayed for by the actual evangelist guy that was there. And he was praying for her, and she didn't know she was supposed to fall down. And so he starts kind of rebuking her on the microphone. Oh, and he boy. said, you know, it, if the man of God tells you to go down, you go down. So she's looking around, and she goes, oh, that's what I'm supposed to do. So she does it. And she came back to, to the seat, and she was just, like, really embarrassed. She felt really ashamed. She, she felt kind of used. She didn't really know how to process what just happened. <laughs> and so I know you've seen a lot of this. You've caught a lot of people. What, what is being slain in the spirit? And, and just really quick, because I want to get to one other thing after this, but just give us a quick synopsis of, is it biblical? And for the people who are doing it, what are the Bible verses they use? And, and what, just help us make sense of that biblically. Okay. So slain in the spirit, we're going to, you want to break that down? Yeah. All right. Um, so you're going to get me in trouble now. That's all right. <laughs> I'll probably get in trouble too. So we'll, we'll be in it so, together. So this is one of those things that is a, a bit of a, a golden calf for the charismatic movement and for the NAR because it's just something that is emotionally driven. Many people think that they're having an experience. A lot of people think it's the way to get closer to God. And so, yeah, the big, the big claims by those who are doing the slaying in the spirit would be that it's the result of the manifest presence of God, that Jesus is, is physically present. He's the one slaying people or that the Holy spirit is this amazing force that he can't, it can't be stopped. So when his presence floods a auditorium, people are going to fall. Um, another thing would be, you know, when we're empty and we need a fresh touch from God, there were many Sundays where that was the, we would abandon the sermon and whether it was my dad or an uncle or someone, they'd say, I just sense that or actually it wouldn't even be, I just sense that would be what we might even say today is I sense, mm. or, you know, uh, right. or is put this on my heart. You know, you hear people say stuff like that. 
in our world, it's, you know, the Lord told me that there are people here who are empty today. And so come up front and be filled with the spirit and being slain in the spirit is getting filled up. So all of those things are the reasons or the drivers behind it. And some of the verses that are used would be like first Kings eight, 10 through 11, where the cloud fills the house of the Lord uh, and the priests are there and they can't stand a minister because of the cloud. And so some would say, oh, well, they couldn't stand to minister. So they had all been slain in the spirit hmm. uh, versus maybe looking at the priests not being able to see or perform priestly duties or uh, do anything in the temple because there was a giant cloud that had fogged the room. Hmm. It was not people falling hysterically. It was not the priest being knocked over and having some euphoric experience. This was literally a cloud that filled the house of the Lord. So they couldn't do their priestly duties. And so sometimes it's looking at the Bible and literally seeing what it says and going, okay, let's not spiritualize that to the degree that we want to read it right into what we're claiming today. Um, there are other instances that they'll use uh, when you have, you know, Abram falling into a deep sleep is said, you know, that he he was slain in the spirit or the spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon in the book of Judges. Well, that, that he was slain in the spirit. There's a lot of terminology flipped around that mm. is just very literal. The Holy Spirit of God came upon David, his mighty warrior, upon Gideon. doesn't mean that they were slain in the spirit. So those are some verses. Another one would be uh, in the New Testament there in John 18, Judas is betraying Jesus and Jesus says, I'm he, when they basically are looking for him and they all draw back and fall to the ground. Mm. Uh, honestly, if, if there's an instance of people being, let's just call it slain in the spirit. Let's pretend that that was one of those moments. It was Jesus saying, I am he, and a bunch of people fall back. I would say that that is a unique experience because Jesus was Jesus. And it, if he flattened a group of men who were there and the power of his words knocked them all back, that's not a license uh, assuming we're not even going down the road of just breaking all that down. Yeah. That's not a license for, for men to get on platforms today and wave jackets and knock everyone over. Those two don't link up. So, right, cause those were kind of his enemies anyway, they were there to arrest him, weren't they? Yes. They, and they, they did not, there was no impartation of his anointing. They don't have this great experience. They don't fall on the ground and cry and then get up and say, you're the son of God. What are we thinking? They are there to arrest him. They all get up yeah. and they carry on. So another thing that we would say is when people are slain in the spirit, uh, you know, one of the kind of leading theologians, so to speak today with a lot of this theology, um, you know, if I named his name, you'd know him, but famous guy, well-known apologist on these topics has said before, you know, I've known so many people that when they get up after being slain in the spirit, they're filled with the spirit They're They get saved. Um, they get sanctified. They they notice patterns of sin fading from their life, and they have this amazing life after that because they were slain in the Spirit. And I would simply ask, okay, why didn't that happen to this group who was arresting Christ if they were knocked mm -hmm. over by Christ himself? So yeah. it's not a good proof text and a good practice to to use. Yeah. Well, I'm so specifically interested in this topic because I've been in so many meetings where I, I was the only one standing. I remember even specifically being in a meeting that had pews on either side of a center aisle. Mm -hmm. And the the man on the stage, I, I can't remember if he blew on the crowd or waved the jacket or whatever he did, but I start to see all the rows. I'm in the very back row on the aisle, and I start to see all of the aisles go down, the entire aisles. And so I'm just praying, Lord, you know, if this is something you have for me, I want it. I want everything that you have for me, but I'm not going to fake it. Mm. And so as the wave starts coming toward me, when it gets to my row, nothing happens. But I look to my right and everybody in my row goes down. And so I'm literally the only person standing. And so I've always been perplexed by this because I also have a couple of people who are very close to me, people who I really... Um, respect who 
also were against it, but in the situations they were in, it they were even resisting it, but it happened. And and they will tell you, like, this was absolutely real. Mm-hmm. There is there is nothing about this where you could say that I faked it or that I was being, uh, you know, pressured by some kind of mob mentality or that it was peer pressure. I mean, this was an absolutely supernatural experience that I was even fighting and trying to get back up. And so I'm curious, um, I know you, you kind of talked about different things that can be happening, but how would you analyze biblically that situation where somebody says, I wasn't faking it. I mean, it's real. It really happened. I would analyze that by looking at uh, probably Jude's categories in the end of his short letter when he explains kind of the three categories of people who are the doubters, the deceived, and then the dangerous. Um, I was in that world. I lived that life. And I remember if, and for example, you know, Elisa, if you would have talked to me 12 or 13 years ago, I would have said the same thing as your friends or these people who are close to you. I would have said, you're crazy. I mean, I have had Oral Roberts lay his hands on me. My uncle lay his hands on me. Everybody lay their hands on me and fallen and cried and prayed. And I used to lay on the stage and cry out to God and say, oh, Lord, I love you. Please use me. Please help me. I, I I want to know you more. I, I would express myself in very honest ways. Yeah. And so I would never discredit the sincerity of these individuals. I would just say that they're in still a state of being deceived or uh, holding to an ideology or a practice that while their intentions may be good and that they just want to know the Lord and they're trying to experience his presence in a meaningful way, they're going about it the wrong way, no matter how good it feels. There are a lot of things that feel really good that are wrong. We know that in general senses. And this is one of them. You don't want to be uh, messing around with this practice because outside of peer pressure and people faking it and the power of suggestion, honestly, there are dark forces at work. There are false spirits that are that have mm-hmm. gone out into the world to deceive people. We know that Satan is a master deceiver. He's the father of lies. Yes. We know from you know books like Second Thessalonians in chapter two that there is a spirit of delusion. There's the spirit of the Antichrist, and there are things that are going to look good, feel good, sound good, and seem really good that are going to be false deceptions. And so mm-hmm. that's how a discerning Christian has to approach this. That's so important what you just said, because I've even had to, over the last few years even, just go back and think about certain experiences that I've had um, that maybe before I would have categorized as some really deeply, you know, spiritual or supernatural thing. But if it doesn't line up with what I see in God's word, then I have Mm -hmm. no choice but to say, Maybe even just, I don't know what that was, but I am going to stick with what God's word says. And um, that's a very humbling and difficult thing to do, especially when you're raised a certain way. Um, just I, I realize even two things I've had to repent for, just theological things that I adopted uh, that I thought were biblical because somebody said they were, or that's just what I was always taught was the interpretation of that verse or, or whatever. And, mm. and so it's, it's been a, a hard thing to have to do. Um, you know, so I, I just want to encourage anyone who's listening. We all have moments in our lives where something doesn't fully line up or make sense. But at the end of the day, I know for me, this is all I can speak to is what I have tried to do is, really get back to the Bible and say, is what I did that time or what I experienced or what I even felt, does that line up with what the Word of God says about worship? Does Mm -hmm. it line up with what the Word of God says I'm supposed to be doing uh, when I'm, because I'm a worship leader, so when I'm singing, what is it I'm doing when I'm singing? And it's been a hard thing to have to really look at um, motivations and to line up my actions with good theology. And sometimes it's not as glamorous when we do that. And um, if singing some hymns without any kind of amazing 
thing happens, then that's great. (laughs) And I don't need to to manipulate something to happen. So um, if you're interested in learning more, get Costi's book, Defining Deception. It's uh, a really important book. Uh, It addresses all the things we've talked about, the mystical miracle movement. He he goes all through the history of how this first came into America and made its way through the evangelical church. It's a very valuable book. I recommend uh, getting it and reading it. Uh, Costi, thank you so much for coming on today to talk about some of this stuff. And I just appreciate you taking the time. Thank you so much, Elisa. If you enjoyed listening to this podcast, you can sign up to receive my posts by email by going to alisachilders.com and clicking the subscribe button, or simply subscribe to the Elisa Childers podcast on iTunes.